Okay, thanks, Michael, for the introduction. So when I was asked a couple months ago to, to give a title for my talk, I, I chose a very vague title, and I, I sort of apologize for that. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll get into really maybe one example um, as we go into this. So in the 20 minutes, next 20 minutes, I'll sort of take you through that one example. So as Michael mentioned, we're really my group, I guess, as an independent laboratory, as well as a shared resource that is available to many investigators who would like to learn something about pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of a therapy that they might be studying. We're, we're available, and, and I just listed here sort of, you know, I'm calling this the big picture. This is really just a, a partial list of different therapies, different agents, a couple different assays even that, that we sort of have up and running and, and maybe things we've been working with for a little while. So 20 minutes, obviously I'm not going to talk about a lot of these, but you know the point is that there are multiple therapies being evaluated here in a translational setting. As you've heard really all morning, I think Dr. Jackson sort of set the tone with the collaborations and we're talking about translational science and therefore collaborations are an essential part of this. And this really sp does span the, the preclinical to clinical sort of scenario with the, the drugs that we've been studying. So the one example that I've picked to talk about is a drug called lenalidomide. And I'll talk about a drug-drug interaction that we sort of discovered and are interested in continuing to evaluate. So first of all, lenalidomide is it's a thalidomide derivative, it's an immunomodulatory agent. It is already FDA approved in a couple of different diseases, multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome. It's under investigation in numerous other uh, malignancies. If you look at the clinicaltrials.gov website, for example, you'll see about 300 to 350 trials that have been activated looking at lenalidomide in combination or as a single agent. It has numerous biological activities immunomodulatory effects on B, T, and NK cells. Cytokine modulation also is anti-angiogenic in some scenarios. It's unclear which of these activities are responsible for efficacy, and of course, it likely will differ depending on the disease as well. <clears throat> so, you know, what, what dose? So, Dr. Trapnell asked the question this morning, you know, what dose do you use? And I thought that was a, maybe a good segue into this talk. I, you know, I, obviously we have preclinical data, but when we get into the clinical setting, we're really obviously dealing with a new beast, humans, so to speak. But in myelodysplastic syndrome, 10 milligrams is kind of a maximum dose due to myelosuppression. But this paper sort of highlights that we can go to higher doses, so we still have myelosuppression, but it's still uh, feasible to go to these high, higher doses in AML because myelosuppression is not such a, a significant issue with AML. However, if we try higher doses in other diseases, we could run into something that could be life-threatening. So here's an example of a toxicity side effect with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, tumor flare, that really limits the dose. And so this just, the point here is just to try to highlight that, you know, we don't always know, obviously, what dose to go with. And it, of course, it could differ depending on the disease. In these cases, it's really toxicity limited, not necessarily efficacy dependent, but toxicity limited. So the, I guess the, the data that I'll show you and the, and the trial that I'll talk specifically about is this phase one study that we conducted here at OSU where we looked at a combination of lenalidomide CC5013 in combination with CCI779, which is Timsirolimus. We did this in patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma. The study PI for this was Craig Hoffmeister. And so when we, when we put the protocol together and when we set out to do this study, we looked at sort of the standard doses that might be given or that have been tried either independently or in combination with other agents in multiple myeloma. And, and we came up with this table that basically said that we could start at this, you know, plus one dose level, 25 milligrams of lenalidomide and 15 milligrams of CCI779. 
the idea then would be to dose escalate from there CCI 779, assuming that we could, you know, continue to escalate without or without seeing um, severe toxicities. Okay, so the standard phase one PK design that we used here, so this this study wasn't designed at all really to evaluate a drug-drug interaction. This was the first time that these two agents had been combined in humans, so it made sense to, to look at pharmacokinetics for both agents, but we really didn't, didn't have a good rationale to, to do a lot of extra work here because if you look at the way that linolidomide is, is eliminated, there's very little, if any, metabolism and it's also renally excreted versus CCI779, which is pretty extensively metabolized. In fact, it's a prodrug, pretty extensively metabolized, and, and it's also, we know, excreted by p protein, which a lot of people have probably heard of. It's very common uh, multidrug resistance transport protein. So the thought was that we could look at the, the pharmacokinetics of each of these two agents with respect to historical data, so we weren't going to directly <coughs> compare the two, so to speak. Okay, so I had to show this table, and, and I thought it was very fitting that Dr. Trapnell this morning mentioned, you know, a lot of times when we do PK, people sort of outside of this, you know, think, okay, you know, let, let's do the PK because we have to do it. We need to see what the drug levels are. So, you know, here's sort of the results of a study. We've generated this huge table. On this study, we, we treated 21 patients. This is some pretty basic modeling that we did to come up with these parameter values. You know, CCI 779, a lot more numbers. You know, so what? Who cares? We did our job. Here's the pharmacokinetics for you. <laughs> you know, but I, obviously that's, that's not why we do this, and it's not to generate tables of numbers. You know, so what more can we learn from this? So if we think about that question about drug-drug interaction, that's the reason we did the PK for both agents in the first place. And if you look at the data, what we've laid out here is, in this case, it's the pharm a few pharmacokinetic parameters of linolidomide that was given at a constant dose. So this is the clearance, the Cmax, and the area under the concentration time curve versus CCI779 that was given at, at different doses. Then we set up the, the uh, plots the same way, I guess in the opposite scenario. So in this case, the, the dose for CCI779 was constant versus varying linolidomide doses. And you know what we started to see here, obviously, were some trends in the data that we really didn't expect to see going into the study. You know, so, okay, we've got trends. You know, are they significant? So, significant in what respect? Okay, so, if we want to publish the data, we have to get good p-values, so we do this analysis. And when we, you know, again, when we look at the linolidomide dose held constant at 25 milligrams relative to varying doses of the other drug, CCI779, what we see is that there are, you know, differences that turn out to be statistically significant when we, uh, when, we, when we look closely. And actually, we saw the same thing in the opposite respect. When we held CCI 779 constant, buried the dose of linolidomide, we also saw significant differences in these PK parameters for CCI 779. You know, so, so what does this propose? It, what it suggests is that there is a drug-drug interaction here where you have CCI 779 directly affecting the pharmacokinetics of linolidomide, and vice versa. You also have linolidomide directly affecting the pharmacokinetics of CCI779. And so this is a very small data set, 21 patients. We would not expect, especially given what we knew going into the study, we would not expect to, to be able to see this, or at least we would not expect to be able to get the p-values. It gives us the ability to publish in a decent journal before we went into the study, so 21 patients, we really need to, to do some validation here. So this is an example of where we started in the clinic, and we kind of went backwards, which happens, I think, very frequently, and probably is the majority of the cases, obviously, when we're looking at experimental agents or combinations of experimental agents. You know, so the first thing that we wanted to ask was, 
obviously, what is the cause of this drug-drug interaction? So we, we had done our own work, and there's you know published data out there. Not that we necessarily believe everything that we read in the literature, but there's published data. We, we confirmed it in our laboratory, too, that really metabolism is almost non-existent with this drug. You know, so is linalidomide maybe a PGP substrate? So that was the other, other possibility. So we went back to the lab. We had our, our pharmacokinetic assay that we could fairly easily adapt so that we could do um, transport studies. So we looked at transepithelial linalidomide transport in PGP overexpressing cells. So these are apical to basolateral, basolateral, basolateral to apical um, evaluations across MDCK2 cells. So it turns out that MDCK2, it's a canine uh, kidney cell line, and it actually expresses an endogenous canine PGP, which we believe is, is probably the, the reason we're seeing the difference here. But in a cell line, in the MDCK2 cells that are overexpressing a human PGP, you know, we, we can obviously increase this difference. So, okay, so this was a little bit of evidence that perhaps, you know, linalidomide is a PGP substrate. So looking a little bit more closely, we went into another cell model, HL60, human leukemia, 60 cell line. Again, in this case, this is a vincristine resistant uh, cell line, and we know that it, it also overexpresses PGP. So in this case, we added some inhibitors. Um, so verapamil is a very standard inhibitor when you're evaluating uh, PGP transport. And we also used the drug that we saw clinically to be interacting apparently with linalidomide, CCI779. So we showed that with the uh, PGP overexpressing cells, we do get decreased uptake, which would be consistent with the idea that linalidomide is a PGP substrate. When we add this standard inhibitor at a, at a very high concentration, we did see some effect, but it wasn't a whole lot. But CCI779 at really a much smaller concentration, we saw you know, a significant effect that essentially you know, CCI779 is blocking the efflux of linalidomide out of these, out of these cells. So this is just showing you um, relative RNA expression levels for the two cell lines that I just, just showed you data for. So, you know, a third, a third way that we could, we could approach this. So it's looking like it's probably a PGP substrate. So we did siRNA knockdown of PGP as well, where we were looking at um, again, our HL60, HL60 and HL60 VCR cell model, basically showing that um, in the HL60 cells, we don't see any uh, protein with our Western blot, and that we can see, if you believe me, there's a decrease in um, protein expression here with the um, siRNA knockdown. And then we showed that in this um, same experiment, we showed that we could alter the, the transport or the uptake again in these cells with this knockdown of the PGP gene. Um, and then here we're showing the RNA levels have been modulated with the knockdown. So, so basically, you know, we, we took the, the clinical data that we observed, we went back in the laboratory, we validated what we, what we sort of anticipated. So at least this is one, um, you know, likely cause for this drug-drug interaction. You know, so obviously this generates more questions. Um, first question is, can we trust the current data or lack thereof? So it's really interesting. With linalidomide, you know, it's, a, it's an FDA-approved drug, and it has been for several years now. You cannot find any mouse pharmacokinetic data in the literature. So, so we're working to remedy that, working with Dr. John Bird and his group, and we've, we've actually generated quite a bit of data now with a graduate student, um, uh, Dolly Rizuski, who has completed a lot of work. I haven't shown that here, but, you know, it just sort of raises the question, even though a drug is already in humans and FDA approved, doesn't mean that we really understand how it works or, you know, what, what affects its disposition, for example. Okay, so I mentioned before that we, we've done some work with metabolism. We've kind of confirmed for ourselves that linalidomide is not metabolized, but we have identified some hydrolysis products that are kind of interesting, and we're, we're actually looking back at clinical samples, and we're finding evidence that these um, hydrolysis products of linalidomide are showing up um, in, in patient blood, essentially. So 
you know, another question might be what are the what is the role or do these hydrolysis products have any impact on therapy? You know, so what other you know drug drug interactions may be relevant for lenalidomide? So in multiple myeloma, lenalidomide is is very commonly combined with dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is used pretty broadly across um, oncology um, in any case, but specifically with multiple myeloma, this is a, a standard therapy. And dexamethasone is a substrate inhibitor and inducer of p glycoprotein. So what does this do, you know, from a um, clinical pharmacokinetic standpoint? And of course, what is the clinical impact of these findings? So, you know, I showed you a couple of examples where you know, depending on the disease, the toxicities that are um, caused by lenalidomide could be severe. We believe that's dose-dependent, pharmacokinetic dependent. You know, so if you are administering this drug somewhat blindly, combining it with agents that could affect its disposition, you're, you're ultimately um, altering the pharmacokinetics and exposure these patients are experiencing. So these could be, you know, important questions to answer. So the work we have ongoing with lenalidomide, um, doing quite a bit in vitro and in vivo drug-drug interaction studies with dexamethasone. So um, really want to look very closely at this question um, to see if, uh, you know, in fact, that, that there's a, an effect here. Evaluation of other potential drug-drug interactions. So we also have a trial that is being uh, led by Bill Bloom here, OSU 10016. This is a combination of lenalidomide and idarubicin and AML. Idarubicin is also a, a substrate of p glycoprotein, so we're looking for a similar type of interaction in this study as well. Um, I mentioned this um, hydrolysis product in clinical samples. And then, you know, so, so what do we do really with all of this data? So I showed you the tables of numbers that we have, and, and that's all great, but it's really until you combine the pharmacokinetics with the pharmacodynamics, until you do that, you know, you're really kind of missing, I think, a big opportunity with the pharmacokinetic data. And if, and if we can develop models that, that do a good job of characterizing what is happening with both the PK and the PD, and most importantly, how the PK affects the PD, if we can develop these models, then we can potentially use those to simulate to evaluate possible, you know, different dosing regimens to see how we can modulate whatever the pharmacodynamic effect is that we're interested in. In this case, it might be toxicities, but, you know, once we um, have a drug target, you know, any drug target of interest, we can develop this relationship um, and then evaluate multiple dosing scenarios. So that is my, uh, one of many possible examples that I chose to show you. So. The acknowledgments here. So, um, Zhao Zhao Yang is a uh, postdoctoral researcher in my group, and she really did the vast majority of the work um, that I presented here. I uh, mentioned Darlene Razuski, she's a graduate student working with Dr. Bird, um, Craig, Bill, Christy, and uh, Dr. Guido Marcucci, who are here next, um, have, have all uh, sort of contributed to this, and these guys have all been working with lunalidomide and, and me as well. Other graduate students in my group who have contributed to this work. I want to mention um, Dr. Ken Chan, Dr. Zhang Fa Lu, Jing Wang, and Yong Hua Ling. One person that I didn't mention here that I should have is also is um, Jeff Cottrell, who didn't work on this project specifically, but these guys sort of comprise the, the shared resource that I had mentioned earlier and who support a lot of the work um, that we do in our group. Um, I think I mentioned John Bird already. Um, of course, Mike Griever, Wolfgang, Sidi, Dave Jarjor. These guys sort of serve as a, a team of mentors for me. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a KL2 award through the CCTS, so very uh, thankful for that. And I've kind of listed the folks um, that are uh, sort of involved in that as well. So Dr. Jackson, uh, Bob Brugemeyer, who you heard earlier earlier today, uh, Dr. Larry Moore, Carla Zadnick, Phil Blinkley and Stephanie Veccarelli, and want to thank the CCTS, CCC, and College of Pharmacy also.
Yeah, yeah, they, no, I, I think they they would be. So, you know, I, and we don't know, obviously, if, if um, you know, that could be a source of interaction. I think that's probably what you're alluding to. But, you know, also they could have some activity. You know, I, I think I mentioned on an earlier slide that although we know a lot about what lenalidomide does, you know, from a mechanistic standpoint, we really don't have a good understanding of, you know, which of those factors are important in any given disease. So we can measure different things that the drug does, but we can't necessarily associate those with, you know, its activity. So it could be that, you know, these hydrolysis products may, may play a role as well. So we'll evaluate that. Yeah, so, you know, in an, in an in vitro system, so, you know, at normal physiological pH, these, so you could have a solution of lenalidomide. Now, 24 hours later, you have zero lenalidomide. So it's pretty quick. But, you know, in terms of the, the kinetics, how long the drug stays around in a, in a human, you know, it, it's probably a little bit less important, but nonetheless, it's, it's still pretty quick. And, and again, we are able to, to measure concentrations of these hydrolysis products. Yeah. So, so um, I would say that to get a drug through the FDA, especially for chemotherapeutic, pharmacokinetics is, is an essential component. So when I mentioned that mouse pharmacokinetics is not available publicly for lenalidomide, I, I don't know this for sure, but I would have to believe that that would be something that, that was submitted with, when, little, when lenalidomide was approved. So, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's such an important piece of the whole story. But, you know, even, even when we know the pharmacokinetics, and I think this is an example, even when we know the pharmacokinetics, we don't necessarily know what that relationship is between the PK and the PD. In this case, I mentioned a few different PD endpoints that we might be interested in looking at. You know, and also, you know, there are probably many, many drug-drug interactions that take place, you know, in, in our you know, in our clinics every day that we don't understand and we really haven't, haven't measured probably well enough. So classically, what, what some people do is do a very um, extensive procedure on the mouse. And you commonly see in typical fifth people, six people or dot, substrate inhibits the uh, substrate. The PCP is normally done. Now people are getting into Thank you, Mitch. Mm -hmm. Gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Guido Marcucci. He's a professor in medicine uh, and the uh, John and Jane McCoy uh, Chair in Cancer Research.